If you're watching this, it's because you've recently acquired a time machine and are thinking about visiting Europe during the Middle Ages. Uh, it's an interesting choice, but it will present you with some challenges. So I'm going to give you some advice here, uh, what to look out for and some things to think about before you go. This can't be comprehensive. You'll have to do a lot of your own research, especially about the particular time and place that you're going to go to. But consider this a jumping off point. First of all, let me get a couple of caveats out of the way. The Middle Ages is a long time, and Europe is a pretty big place. So I'm going to restrict what I'm saying here to the Central Middle Ages, which is about 1100s through the 1300s. And I'm going to talk about what kind of that core area of what English speakers usually think of when they think of medieval Europe, which is England, France, Germany, kind of Northern Italy, that area. Also, I'm going to assume that you're going to be visiting a medieval town. If, when you go, and that's because if you're visiting a rural area or a small farming village, it'll just be harder to explain why you're there hanging around looking at people if you don't know anyone there. It's not necessarily that you would be unwelcome. Actually, you'd probably be very welcome. Um, they'd be very curious about you. But uh, yeah, it's just, and there's not as much to see. So I'm just assuming you're not going to visit a village. Also, visiting a castle is not really a good option because that's really not a place that you can just wander in as a rando and poke around and look at things. Um, it's a private, it's private property, essentially, and it's kind of a quasi-military installation. So it's not really a thing for tourists. You'll have to, if you want to visit a castle as a tourist, you'll probably have to visit now. <laughs> maybe, maybe travel back to a period in time after the castles mattered, you know, but not in the Middle Ages. Okay, so first of all, health. Health is going to be a big concern. Uh, you will need to get vaccinated for everything you can, and even then it won't be enough. You will very likely get sick if you go. Uh, especially, you have to worry about GI issues, gastrointestinal infections. Uh, as someone coming in with, shall I say, a naive gut, uh, you will very likely... Um, have your body will have a reaction to the native biome of the you know that that will be present in the food and water that you're consuming. Also, many parts of Europe in the Middle Ages had malaria, uh, so you will also need to take anti-malaria medicine, especially in, if you're in the southern part of Europe. I don't think that's an issue in medieval England, but I actually don't know for sure. So you'll need to check up on that if that's your destination. Uh, so, but anyway, just something to keep in mind. But I'm not a doctor. Definitely consult a healthcare professional before you go. Another important consideration is personal safety. And this is going to be a big deal, too. You really have to put a lot of thought into this. You should travel in a group. Uh, don't travel alone. And the reason I say that is there are a lot of bad actors. And not everyone is going to be a bad actor. Most of them are going to be totally cool people. They're not going to try to hurt you. But there are plenty of people who will do you harm. Uh, crime uh, is rampant, especially like petty crime, personal theft, things like that. But muggings, or what we would call muggings today, are not uncommon. And uh, that's especially something that travelers need to worry about. Because a traveler is away from his support network. Um, and, and this comes to a really big difference between the way a modern society works and the way a medieval society works. In a medieval society, you are protected by being part of a social network, by being part of a, a group that you were connected with, and that group provided protection for you. And it might be a peer network, like if you're a merchant, being connected with a broader community of merchants through, say, a guild uh, or some other organization. That was your support network. Also, your family was actually a more important support network. Having cousins and brothers and sisters and nephews and you know, having this like extended family where people are looking out for each other. Uh, that was the, the main protection that people had from violent crime. Uh, because uh, if someone were thinking about doing harm to you, they would have to think about having repercussions you know, having retaliation, dealing with retaliation from your family or your broader support network. Um, and the support network could take different forms. So there's family, there's your peer network of your colleagues in your field, in your, in your profession. 
There's also uh, hierarchical support networks like households. So if you're a member of a, a nobleman's household, then you, you know, then if someone were to mess with you, they knew that they were going to possibly you know, have to deal with your entire household or, you know, the nobleman that you were a part of, you know, when you, when you took on work with somebody, you were considered to be under their protection. A serf in a rural area was considered to be under the protection of the lord that he worked under. All uh, relationships in the medieval world, in medieval Europe, worked in these kind of ways where people were enmeshed in social webs with each other. Uh, and, and, you know, no one was an individual. Everyone was part of a group and actually of multiple groups in different ways. And that was that enmeshing of the social network that held society together. and. From that arose a lot of the practices um, and a lot of the kind of issues that you would come up as a traveler. I'll be getting to some of these issues later on in the video. But one, one of these considerations is people in the Middle Ages had a deterrent against crime in that, um, you know, at least violent crime. It wasn't a perfect deterrent, but in the case of, you know, a, a roving band of bandits or thieves or whatever who might want to try to take advantage of you, beat you up in the road and take your stuff. Um, they would do that if they thought they could get away with it, if they thought they didn't have to worry about retaliation. So traveling alone wasn't, uh, wasn't usually a good idea. And that would vary actually from place to place and time to time, especially if you have a situation where, there, you know, there were some periods of time in the Middle Ages where if there were a lot of uh, famines, or if there was like a succession of bad harvest years that um, drove a lot of people into destitution, drove a lot of people out of the countryside into the cities looking for uh, a better life, and then they get to the city and they, they can't find anything to do there, they turn to crime. Uh, so at certain times, of, uh, certain periods of time, certain places, crime, you know, and the threat of violent crime was higher than at others. But anyway, just be on your guard all the time. Uh, so travel in a group. Um, don't go by yourself. Because if you go by yourself, you're a target. Now, it's really common in the Middle Ages for people to carry protection. Uh, and you should definitely do that. You know, carry a, da a dagger. Learn how to use it. Um, if you don't know how to use a sword, don't bring a sword. Because <laughs> you don't want to... You Because you won't know what you're doing. But... Um, a dagger or some kind of knife, just something to help protect you if someone attacks you physically. Another thing to think about with regard to safety, even if you're not personally attacked, your stuff's likely to get stolen. Keep your valuables on your person at all times. Don't ever leave them unattended. They will get swiped. Guaranteed. And the thing is, if someone stole your stuff, there was no getting it back. It was almost impossible to recover stolen goods. Unless it was like your neighbor and you knew he stole it, then you could take him to court. But um, if you're just wandering around, you don't know anybody in the town, and then you get pickpocketed, you don't have any recourse. Most crimes in the Middle Ages did not go punished. And because of that, when a criminal did get caught, they gave that criminal really severe punishments. And th this is one of the famous things about the Middle Ages. You may already be aware of this. The very, very severe bodily punishments that would be inflicted on people for what we would today regard as relatively minor crimes, at least not, not crimes that would rise to the level of necessitating maiming someone or causing so much physical harm to someone. But the reason that was done in the Middle Ages was that it was so hard to catch criminals. The only way to deter crime was to make, it, make them think that in the unlikely scenario where they do get caught, they're going to really regret it. So it was kind of like making up for the fact that most criminals didn't get caught. And in modern society, it's more common for criminals to get caught. And also, there are other things we have in modern society. We have prison. We have a prison system, you know, and, and we, have, we have a police system that can enforce laws more effectively. And so uh, you don't need that severity of punishment anymore. All right. I mean, maybe need's not the right word. That's kind of a value judgment. But, um, but anyway, the prison system is another thing to point out. In our modern society, especially in the United States, but not, not just in the U.S., we have this you know, very elaborate prison system for dealing with criminals. 
in uh, medieval Europe, hardly anyone was imprisoned. I mean, you, you might be imprisoned temporarily while you're awaiting a judgment or while you're awaiting execution. And, uh, but that was mainly it. Uh, when you got punished, like if you did a crime and you go to court and they pronounce judgment on you, the the punishment was usually inflicted immediately, uh, certainly that same day. The only time that people in the Middle Ages got imprisoned for any length of time was when they were wealthy noblemen, uh, when they were part of the elite, and they were captured in battle. Then they would be held. Um, for ransom. You know, they would be, they would be held uh, until such time as their family could pay a bunch of money to set them free. And so holding them in prison made sense because they were going to get a, a financial reward from holding that person in prison. General imprisonment of like the general population of criminals in general did not make sense from a financial standpoint. Remember, medieval societies were extremely poor by modern standards. There was far less wealth in the economy, and governments had way less wealth than modern governments do. And this was true of medieval Europe. It's not just true of that. It was also true of larger, more powerful empires and states in Asia. Even though they were richer and more powerful than European states at the time, like China and you know, places like that, they still were very poor by modern standards. So it like it would be impossible for a medieval culture to like have a prison system and have that be the way they punish people. Now let's talk about money. You will need to bring money with you. People in the Middle Ages used silver coins for everything. So that's what you have to bring. Now different coins had different amounts of silver. Some mints would uh, introduce more impurities or less impurities into the silver content. So the silver would vary in purity and that affected the value of the coin. So different places, actually everybody, everywhere in Europe had the same, like, um, denominations. There were pennies, shillings, and, or I guess I'd say pence, pence, shillings, and pounds. Um, and it was 12 pence to the shilling, 20 shillings to the pound. That was, the, that's how it worked everywhere. And that will sound familiar to English speakers. If you're from Britain, if you're old enough, you'll remember prior to decimalization, like, you know, that's how British currency worked. But that was also how currency worked elsewhere in the area that we're looking at. In France, Germany, and Italy, they all had these same denominations with the same amounts. So, and they had different names for it, of course. So in Romance-speaking areas, pennies were called uh, denari. Well, it comes from the Latin word denar denarius, denarius in Latin. So denier in French, uh, denaro in Italian. Uh, in Germanic-speaking areas, they had some variation of the word penny, or in modern High German, it's pfennig, uh, but some, some like pfenning, or they would call it some variation of that. Uh, but that was the base unit, and that was like the standard, that was like the unit of exchange, that's the penny, that was what people used on a daily basis. Shillings and pounds were never coined, I shouldn't say never coined, but rarely coined. Milan did have shilling coins, but pounds were never coined. You won't find pound coins. They were only units of account. So when like accountants or whatever were keeping track in the books, they would they would keep track in terms of pounds, shilling, pe pounds, shillings, pence. But uh, in your day to day life, you're only going to be work working with penny coins, silver pennies, and half pennies, and quarter pennies, and stuff like that. That's that's like the normal currency of exchange. Uh, but because the silver content could vary from one place to another. Pennies in different places had different values relative to each other. They had different exchange rates. And the exchange rate was based on the silver content within the penny. And so when you travel to an area, like you'd go to another town, you would have to change your coins for local, for, you know, you'd go to a money changer and change your coins and um, to get coins that local merchants would recognize so they would know what the value of that was. Uh, every town of any size would have money changers. That was a standard institution. Uh, That's not the kind of thing you would find in a rural village, but, but towns will have it. Okay, now, where should you sleep? There are several options for this. Now, if you're out in a rural area, you don't have many options. In a rural area, you only have really two options that I can think of. Either you can stay with somebody, say, in a private home, um, and that would be, like, a very common thing. Uh, that would be like for a traveler, you're passing through people. What, what will happen? I know I was going to talk about towns. Let me just talk about a village for a second. 
if you're passing through a small vi farming village, everybody's going to notice, oh, a stranger, you know? And depending on, like, you know, if they're on a main road where people pass by a lot, that might not necessarily attract a lot of attention, but, you know, depending on how, how remote the town is. But people, if you're stopping by and you're, you know, like, looking around, people are going to strike up conversations with you. They're going to want to know who you are, where you're going. Uh, and uh, so you'll need a backstory. I'll be talking about backstory, the backstory you need to set up later on in the video. But people will be interested in you because people enjoy conversation. Uh, the idea of having a conversation with somebody they haven't had a conversation with before, that would be very attractive. Remember, people in the Middle Ages didn't have TV, no movies, no internet. So, you know, they have to make their own entertainment by talking to each other. That was a lot of what they did. And so having somebody new to talk to and to hear from, hear news from, also, you know, there were no newspapers. Uh, the way you got news was by talking to people, uh, talking to people who traveled through, talking to someone like maybe you have a neighbor that went on a pilgrimage. He comes back. You want to hear all about the place he went to. You know, that, that's how news traveled in Europe. So, and, and that wasn't just there. It was, this was everywhere in the world at the time, because there are new newspapers. There is no news delivery system other than just word of mouth. So, um, you will be welcomed into people's homes. People will take an interest in you. They will be very friendly with you. They'll welcome you into their home. That would be a very common thing. The other option in a rural area is a monastery. Monasteries and convents were required to take in travelers. Now, in the city, you have another option. There, there are still monasteries and friaries in cities, and you can find accommodation there. You could also go to, uh, you might you know, be invited to someone's home and, and stay with them. But a third option would be to stay at an inn. Uh, like a like an establishment designed for taking in uh, guests for the night. Now, where to eat? Uh, here again, you have several options. If you're staying at an inn, they will have food there usually that you can purchase. If you're staying at someone's private home, they will provide you a meal. Another option is cook shops, which are basically little takeaways or takeout joints. They'll have a counter facing the street. You walk up to the counter and you can order your food, and either they'll make it to order, or they'll have pre-made food they can sell you. Uh, there's a variety of food you can buy this way, especially food that like packs well, and you can carry with you, like pasties, that kind of thing. Uh, and then another option would be um, a weekly market, where uh, once a week, farmers or vendors from the area will come in, and you can buy vegetables and fruit. In, in season. Everything's in season in the Middle Ages. You can't ever buy anything out of season. Uh, but depending on what time of year you're there, that's another option. Okay, now let's talk about the language barrier. And this is a bit of a tricky situation because every small region had its own language or dialect, depending on what you want to call it. And so what language you, pr you prepare for, what language you study before you go, depends on where you're going to go. Although we don't have good learning materials for every single language and dialect as it was spoken in medieval Europe, most of the language materials we have for medieval languages are for languages that got a lot of literary work done. So take French, for example. Everywhere in France, they had different dialects. Different, every region, every province had its own language, essentially, that was not entirely intelligible with those of neighboring areas. So if you were from Champagne, for example, you wouldn't necessarily be able to understand someone from Picardy or Normandy. Uh, all of them had their own variation of Old French. But the Old French of the textbook is the Old French of Paris, because that was the dialect that people wrote in when they wrote vernacular literature. And same with Old High German. Old High German that you learn in a textbook is not the way it was spoken everywhere throughout Southern Germany. So... If you learn a vernacular language, be aware that you may still have some difficulty like communicating with people, depending on where you go. So if you learn Old French and you go to Paris, you'll be fine. But if you learn Old French and you go somewhere else, like Dijon or something, you might have some difficulty understanding people, even though you studied the language. But the local language or dialect is not your only option, because Europe was a kind of multicultural place, multilingual place. And people moved around from one place to another, and there were, you know, networks that spanned geographical areas. And so because of that, they used 
what we would call international languages to to handle those contacts from different cultures. And the two most common situations where that would occur was in the church, because the church was an international organization. And so it used an international language for its internal communication. That was Latin. And then also merchants would have long range contacts and they would have partners and people they were working with that lived in other parts of Europe and the Mediterranean. And they needed to be able to communicate with each other. And so there was a mercantile language called lingua franca, which was kind of a simplified romance language that was a go-between language. It was kind of a, like a, an averaging out of different dialects in Italy and France and Catalonia, such that you know merchants from different parts of the Mediterranean would be able to communicate with each other. But one interesting thing about lingua franca is it left its mark on modern day languages around the region. If you look at modern Greek, uh, modern Egyptian Arabic, um, probably also Turkish, I don't really know. Um, there are vocabulary words in those languages that derive from that late medieval, early modern lingua franca of the merchants of the Mediterranean. Uh, so anyway, if you're presenting yourself as a merchant, then knowing lingua franca would actually work out for you because you'd be able to, you know, communicate with people in different cities and, and you should be okay. Uh, which language you learn and which language you use really depends on what your backstory is going to be. Now, if you learn, let's say you learn old French and I mean, I'm going to be musing a little bit here, so I hope you don't mind. But let's say you're going to you're going to learn old French and then you're going to go to Paris. I mean that would make sense. Old French is what they speak in Paris, right? Uh the the, the you know the textbook old French. Uh but you're not from Paris or the Île-de-France. You're not from that area, right? And and you can't go around telling people, "Oh yeah, I'm from here. I'm from a village 10 miles outside of town" because you might meet somebody from that village and they're not going to know who you are. Your backstory has to be that you're from far away. Um, and uh, let me talk about the backstory for a minute, and then I'll come back to the language thing. But you will have to have a backstory. You will have to have a, some explanation for who you are and why you're there, because people are going to be curious and they're going to ask you. Um, you know, I mean, actually, I should clarify, it's not just curiosity. I mean, it is curiosity, but it's not just curiosity. So they also have to know who you are in order to know what to do with you. And this is going to be something that's going to be kind of unfamiliar uh, to modern viewers, especially if you're from North America or Europe or Australia or, you know, a very egalitarian, a very social equality oriented culture. Uh, this is going to be a little bit weird, you know, because in our cultures, we have this idea that everybody's on an equal footing. Everybody's equal to each other. Nobody's better or worse than anybody else. Nobody gets any special treatment. That's that, and we're so surrounded by that idea that's in, so ingrained in us culturally that going to medieval Europe is going to be really weird because you go to medieval Europe, and that is not at all what people think there. There's very much an idea that people have different social levels, people are on different parts of the ladder. Ladder is not even a good uh, thing, but it's not something you can climb typically. Uh, but you're on different levels of the I don't know, the layer cake or whatever. And um, when you deal with somebody else, you have to know, are they a social superior or a social inferior? And, and there are a lot of social rules involved in how you deal with someone based on that. So if you meet someone who's your social superior, you have to sh act very deferen deferentially to them. You, you know, you might have to like uh, get down on your knees to acknowledge them. You'll have, you know, say very like polite language to them, don't turn your back on them, don't and show disrespect, you know, all these like rules regarding how you deal with a social superior. And then there are other expectations for how you deal with a social inferior. And so because of those rules, when people meet you, they need to know what to do with you. They need to know, are you a social superior or an inferior? Okay, so you'll need a backstory that puts you in a certain class or a certain like rank. 
And then that will determine your social world. So, and first of all, we have to come up with something that's plausible. You need to become, need to come from somewhere far away. You can't be a local. So, uh, you have two options. You're either a merchant or a pilgrim. I mean, another option would be you're a refugee, but, um, that's not a good idea. People might try to take advantage of you. So, uh, go with either pilgrim or, or merchant. If you, or I guess you could try to do like, I'm a churchman, you know, you could do that. That'd be interesting. I mean, if you know a lot of Latin, if you're good at Latin, if you know a lot about the medieval church, you might try to pull that one off, be a cleric, but, uh, pilgrims could be anybody. Uh, pilgrimage is you're, you know, you're traveling to some location in order to visit a, visit a shrine. And, that, and this was the most common form of what we would call tourism in the Middle, in the middle Ages. Um, there are a variety of shrines all over the place in Europe, but there are only a few locations that would draw pilgrims from a long distance. So Santiago de Compostela is very famous. Rome would be another location. Paris would be a, a fair location to draw pilgrims from far away. Uh, Canterbury is, of course, a, a, a famous example from English literature because of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Cologne in Germany, um, I guess probably Vézelay. And, you know, there are different locations where that would be the case. So if you're visiting a town that would be a major pilgrimage site, that could be one thing. Or it could be on the road to a pilgrimage site and you're just stopping by for a few days. That could be your backstory. You, you might not even be visiting. You know, let's say you want to you could you could visit Paris and tell everybody you're on the way to Santiago and you're just stopping by and that would be a totally legit backstory for you know people would totally buy that uh merchant is another thing uh but then with a merchant you've got to you know you've got to have a backstory about what do you trade in and where is your family located and you you know who are your contacts in this area and stuff um so that might be a little bit trickier to do um, I personally would go with Pilgrim. I think that would be the easiest. But then you've got to decide then, of course, you're traveling with a group, right? You're not by yourself, but you got to decide what is your, what is your role in the town you came from? Are you a peasant? Are you a manual laborer? Are you a craftsman? Do you have some trade or profession? Whatever that is, research what the clothing would be for that person and wear that. And then whoever you're dealing with, whoever you're interacting with in the city, those are the people that you would most likely have long conversations with. Those are the kind of people that would invite you into their homes and want to make friends with you and talk to you. So decide ahead of time who it is in the city you want to be hanging out with. And if you come into the city as uh, in the guise of a wealthy merchant, you're basically not really going to have much interaction with the hired help, you know, or with the servants or with uh, you know, manual laborers or any of that. You're, and you're not going to have too much interaction with nobility. You're really just going to be dealing with other merchants, especially merchants of your class, especially merchants who deal in the same item that you deal in, which again is probably an argument against doing that because then you really have to know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, I'm a silver merchant. Oh, I am too. You know, oh, I got to, <laughs> let's have a 20 minute conversation about trading silver in the Baltic Sea. And I'm like, oh boy, I'm not ready for that. You know, so <laughs> th think about, think about the backstory. Uh, and then coming back to language, uh, your choice of what to do with like what, how to prepare your language skills for like come into this. If your backstory is going to be that you're a church guy, then you'll need to know some Latin. Not necessarily fluent, not all clerics were fluent in Latin, but they knew enough Latin to get by and they knew enough Latin to communicate with each other. But if you're telling everybody that you're, say, a leather, what is that called? Tanner? Let's say you're, you're telling everybody, I'm a tanner from a city 2,000 miles away, and I'm on my way to do a pilgrimage. If you know a bunch of Latin, that'd be kind of weird. Or if you're, telling, if, you're if you're showing off your Latin skills, people are like, why does a tanner know Latin? Uh, so be aware of that. And people are uh, used to meeting people from different places that have different dialects. So they're used to dealing with uh, language barriers. So don't let that stop you from talking to people. And people are going to definitely talk to you. They're going to find out what's your trade, where are you from. 
They want to get a sense of not only what's your social rank in, in relation to them, but also who's your social network in the town, who are you connected with in the town, and they need all that information to know like how they should interact with you. And if they find out that you're um, a complete naive person who has no idea what's going on in medieval Europe um, and you don't know anything, then get ready to get swindled. All the shop owners are going to see you as a mark and rip you off. Oh, that's something about shopping. I didn't mention shopping earlier. All shopping is haggling in medieval Europe. Uh, it's not like today where you go to some place in Europe or North America and you go to the store and there's a price listed there. That's exactly what you pay. That is not how they did it in the Middle Ages. You will be haggling all the time. And if they think that you don't know how much something costs, they will rip you off. Uh, so just be prepared for that. Okay, there's uh, one more thing I want to talk about. And that is, what if you're not a white Christian? And I guess I should clarify, white Catholic. What if you're not a white Catholic? What do you do? Because obviously, obviously almost everyone in Europe, Western Europe, in the Middle Ages was white Catholic. Okay, well, let's deal with this. First of all, let's, let's cover what if you're not white? What if you're, you know, what if you don't pass as European? Um, you don't have to be as worried as I think you might be. Racism as it exists today did not exist in medieval Europe. I mean, they did have prejudice, but it wasn't like it is now. Like nowadays, there are a lot of white people who think black people like lack um, intelligence, they lack morals, um, you know, they have no uh, self-control, they have all these ideas. Those ideas did not exist in the Middle Ages. Uh, I think, I don't know this for sure, but my guess is that all comes from slavery. Those are all, in my own personal theory, which I have not been able to verify because I haven't delved into the literature on this, but my theory is these prejudices date back to slavery and they come from the slave owner slave dynamic and the kinds of uh, opinions that slave owners will have about slaves or the kinds of criticisms that slave owners will have of slaves. They're lazy, they're uh, incompetent, you know, they're, they're, they lack intelligence. And there are good reasons why slaves would appear to be those things. Uh, but, um, but slave owners were somehow oblivious to, the, <laughs> to why, why a slave would not seem to be hardworking. <laughs> it's weird. Slave, slave owners are weird. But, um, but, but that's not in the Middle Ages. There was some slavery in Europe, actually, but it wasn't race-based. That's the difference. And so people in medieval Europe did not automatically associate black people or people with black skin with those negative traits like, like happened in the 18th, 19th centuries and continued on and has partially continued on till today. So my point is, if you're a black person visiting medieval Europe, you won't face exactly the same kind of racial prejudice that you would if you were traveling to 19th century Europe. But, you know, there, there were ideas about races, you know, there, there were theories, like people in Europe knew that there were people in other parts of the world that looked different from them. They knew that people in Africa had black skin. They assumed that kind of the general theory, um, the only theory from the Middle Ages that I'm familiar with, I don't know if there were others, but the theory that I've encountered was that it was because of the sun. That being farther south in the tropics, you know, in the, in the zone near the equator, you get a lot more sun down there. Sun is overhead all the time, right? And that kind of bakes you and it like cooks your skin or whatever. It might literally cooks your skin, but you know, it, like it was the sun's rays that made people dark, that made, made people have dark skin in Africa. That was what people thought. That was what medieval Europeans thought. Um, and I believe that was also what medieval Muslims in the Middle East thought too. Um, but it's been a long time since I read about that, so I could be a little bit mistaken. Actually, medieval Muslims and medieval Europeans had very similar ideas about this sort of thing. They believe that the, Euro that the world was divided into climes, um, uh, which are like uh, ranges of latitude, you know, with the equator at one extreme and the polar region at the other extreme. And then there were various zones in between and there were canonically seven climes 
seven of these like parallel zones and the behavior of people or the kind of the nature of people in different climes was determined by their environment. You know, it was a kind of environmental explanation for cultural differences. Uh, you find this among Muslim writers in the Middle East talking about Europeans and talking about people from other areas, but Muslims in the Middle East would talk about Europeans and saying, well, they are the way they are because they're so far north and it's so cold up there. And then Europeans would say that about people in the Middle East and people in Africa. Well, they are the way they are because it's so hot down there. But when you show up, I think what you're going to encounter is just curiosity, not necessarily fear. Um, I know that there, there's this popular idea that people in Europe, in medieval Europe, were afraid of anything that was different. I don't think that's really fair. I don't think that's accurate. Uh, it, I think there's more to it than the hat. I, they, they were very interested. I mean, they were interested in meeting people. I mean, okay, I shouldn't generalize. There were all, there was a whole range of personalities, obviously. Some people would have been really cool. Some people would have been, um, unpleasant. You know, they would have unpleasant personalities. And that's true wherever you go and whenever you go. Uh, but let me give you an example. It's actually not African, but Chinese. But there, was, uh, there were these two Chinese um, Christians from medieval China. At the time of the Mongol uh, conquest, it was after, after the Mongol conquest, they traveled westward from China to Iraq where the headquarters of their church was because they were members of the uh, church of the east and uh, so they traveled to iraq and then once they got there the mongol ruler in iraq sent one of them on forward to europe as a diplomat uh, mongols did this quite regularly they would get people who had some like something in common with the people they were going to contact so Mongols dealing with Europeans, they knew they were Christians, so they would find some Christian to send over there because they knew Christians would like to talk to Christians. So this guy goes to Europe and he visits, travels around Italy and France. He's a Chinese guy, you know, <laughs> he doesn't look European. And he wrote a memoir of his experience. He had a great time. He loved it. He, and he said, everybody was really great. Everybody was really friendly. You know, that's basically what he says. Uh, now, he was going as a churchman and as a diplomat. And so, of course, that would affect how people dealt with him. It meant that he mostly interacted with other churchmen and other political leaders uh, or political people politically important. Um, but I'm confident that if you're going as a Chinese person or someone who looks Chinese and you're going there with the backstory of I'm going there as a merchant or whatever, uh, that you'll do just fine. Now, in modern times, like 18th, 19th centuries, especially 19th century, Europeans got really obsessed with, with uh, race and racial categories, and they, they like, defined themselves as white, and like, that was their primary identity, or, or, you know, or something, some subset of that, like German or whatever. Um, but in the, and, and so what made you an in-group or an out-group was whether you're white or not, right? So if you look at 1930s Germany, Ger Jews were on the out group uh, because they were not like of the correct racial category. And even people of Jewish descent who had converted to Christianity were still considered Jews in 1930s Germany, right? But in the Middle Ages, what mattered was, are you a Christian or not? If you're a Christian, you're in the in group. If you're not a Christian, you're in the out group. So if you're an African Christian or an Asian Christian, and you're going and visiting Europe, or you're going presenting as Christian, you know, in the guise of a Christian, perhaps, then uh, everybody will be cool with you. They'll have no problem with you whatsoever. Uh, but if you're going around telling everybody, I'm a Muslim, well, you know, they might not, they, they might be a little bit put off by that. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and the reason that Chinese guy had such a great time in Europe was he was, well, first of all, he was a diplomat representing a powerful foreign potentate, but also he was a Christian and a Christian monk, you know, a Christian priest. So um, the, the fact that he belonged to what we would call a different racial category didn't matter. People in medieval Europe remarked on physical differences when Asiatic people would come into Europe, 
you know, um, the Huns and the Mongols, you know, they came to Europe at different periods, but, you know, they, writers would remark, oh, they looked kind of weird. You know, they looked, they had this, these facial features or whatever, they looked different from us. Um, but, uh, so they were aware of physical differences, but that wasn't the primary thing that they cared about in terms of t deciding how they were going to deal with you. Again, it's your class and your religion that really matters. Yeah. So that's persons of color. Now, what about religious minorities? What if you're Jewish? What if you're Muslim? What if you're something else? Now, if you're a Jew visiting medieval Europe, you've got a couple options. You can either present as a Christian or present as a Jew. Presenting as a Christian is probably uh, feasible if you're only visiting for a few days and you're not planning on going to the synagogue or hanging out with the Jewish population there. You just want to like see the sights. Um, just dress as a Christian. Tell everybody you're a Christian from far away. They won't, they won't question that. Um, if, though, you want to actually visit the Jewish area, the Jewish neighborhood, and meet with the Jews, go to the synagogue and see what it's like and you know, that whole thing, then you're going to have to present as a Jew. You, so you make sure you dress as a Jew, look up what were the rules for how Jews should dress. Jews had usually, it, it varied actually by time and place, but typically Jews were expected to dress in some distinctive way so that everybody would know just by seeing that they were Jewish. And again, this goes back to what I was talking about before, where everybody had to deal with everybody else, given some, you know, very intricate rules of social etiquette. And they needed to know, oh, how should I be interacting with you, right? And if, if, if they couldn't tell the difference between a Jew and a Christian by looking at them, from their point of view, they felt like um, kind of the social, the social bonds and the social network is going to be, you know, start to fall apart. So that, that they kind of made a big deal about that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, uh, you will probably face some prejudice if you're presenting as Jewish, you're going to, you know, they're going to be, a lot of the Christians are just not going to like you. Um, but if you're hanging out in the Jewish quarter and going to the synagogue, cause you know, Jewish people typically just stuck to themselves. They had their own kind of like separate social world. It was separate from the Christian world. And there were certain points of contact between those two worlds in like business dealings and things like that. But uh, typically the Jews kind of kept to themselves. And, you know, and largely it was because they had to, you know, because they were forced to do that by the Christians. Um, so that'll be, that'll be a choice you'll have to make as a Jewish person, which way you want to go on that. Now, if you're a Muslim or a member of some other, let, let's talk specifically about Muslims. If you're a Muslim and you want to go visit medieval Europe, um, don't tell people you're a Muslim. Now, um, it depends, actually. It depends on where you're going. Medieval Christians did not really get Islam. They, didn't, they, they did not understand it at all. As far as they knew, Islam or Muslims were simply another version of pagan. Now, Christians knew what pagans were. They knew what Jews were. They knew what heretics were. Heretics are like Christian rebels. Those were the three categories of non-Christian as far as medieval Christians were concerned. Those were the three categories they knew how to make sense of people who weren't Christian. But there was no concept of, as far as, you know, they knew that there were probably variations among different pagan groups, but beyond that, they didn't really think much about it. Generally speaking, I mean, the intellectuals did. There were some people in Europe who, like, I'm talking about the general population. Um, <clears throat> And in the general imagination, Muslims were pagans. If you read popular literature at the time, when they portray Muslims, they portray them as pagans, worshiping idols, um, you know, setting up idols in their temples and worshiping those. And so generally speaking, I'd say, don't go around telling people you're a Muslim. Now, there are some exceptions to that. So there were some places around the Mediterranean that had Muslim merchants that would come and visit. And even in Constantinople, there was a mosque. There were some Muslims living in southern Italy and Sicily. There were also plenty of Muslims living in Spain, obviously, for obvious reasons. But those would be possibilities for you to go and visit if you wanted to go there. Now, um, if you are some other religion like Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, uh, as far as they won't really know, 
you know, Hinduism, that's like classic paganism as far as a medieval Christian is concerned. Buddhism is an interesting one, though. Uh, there is an account by a guy named William of Rubric, who was uh, originally from the Netherlands. He lived in the 1200s, and he traveled to Asia to meet with the Mongol Khan. And in his travels, he walked all the way over there. And on the way, he met Buddhists. And it's so interesting to read him talk about the Buddhists because he clearly didn't really understand. Because he would talk to these Buddhists and the way he describes them, he's like, they wear yellow robes and they shave their heads and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you, you as the reader, you're like, oh, they're Buddhists. He's reading Buddhists. And then he's like, but, you know, they believe in the gospel. They believe in, like, the one God. And so, oh, they're Christians. And, and then he kept talking to them. And he's like, I don't get it. They're, they don't, they're Christians, but they don't quite talk like Christians. He couldn't figure it out. So um, it's because, you know, like, there was no way of fitting Buddhism into the category, the mental categories he had. But, uh, but that, I'm bringing that up to say that... Um, it's possible that as a Buddhist, people would just assume you're just a strange form of version of Christian from, from far in the East. There was a substantial Christian population in Asia in the Middle Ages, and it was not, and, and uh, Christians in Europe were aware of their existence. So uh, being a Christian from Asia would not raise eyebrows. Okay, there's one more thing I want to talk about. I don't know if I said one more thing before, but this really is one more thing. I have seen online when people talk about time travel to the Middle East, to the to medieval Europe, they talk about, oh, I couldn't possibly go there because if I go there, they'll hang me as a witch or they'll burn me at the stake or as a witch because I'm wearing modern clothes and because I'm talk funny and whatever. Nope. No, 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 no. That's totally wrong. Um, people in the Middle Ages were not scared of people just because they were different. They were scared of people who were different in a way that that challenged the social order and threatened social chaos. Like, that would be an issue. But uh, just because you're strange and different and from a faraway place, they're not going to just assume you're a witch. That's crazy. And I've already talked about clothing. If you show up in modern clothes, they're not going to know what's going on. They, you know, because like I, like I said, like they need to know how to interact with you on a social in a social way uh, like like should they be deferential or not and you know what kind of language should they shoot should they use with you what kind of gestures should they use with you and they're not going to know that if you show up in modern clothing that looks totally foreign totally they have no frame of reference for modern clothing so that's why you should go in in local clothing. It's not because if you go, they'll claim you as a witch in modern clothing. It's that they'll um, um, they just won't know how to talk to you. Now, if they see you arrive, obviously that would raise some questions, and you, they'd probably assume there's some kind of witchcraft at, at work. But uh, so make sure you arrive. In a, in a manner and in a time where they would not notice. So let's talk about arrival, actually. This is a good good thing to talk about. You don't want them to see you arriving. So how should you arrive? You know, there are going to be forests pretty near the town. They're not going to have a lot of people in them. People did not like going into the forest. So you're not likely to, you know, be seen if you arrive there. Also, you should arrive at night. Because there are no street lights or electricity or anything. So nighttime was very dark. And in fact, if you want to be especially safe, find out when the full moons are and don't arrive then. You know, arrive when, when the moon would not be out. It'll be extremely dark. On the other hand, make sure you don't arrive in a town at dark because towns typically had a curfew. And if they find you violating the curfew, they could throw you in prison and then put you on trial. Uh, you want to avoid that whole business. So arrive outside the town at night, you know, away from the roads, um, and then you can just go into the town when you're, you know, in the morning when you're, when everybody else is going in. So that that's easy enough. Now, if you're going around flashing your modern technology, what's going to happen? Um, it depends on what your modern technology does. If somebody sees plastic or 
uh, some strange fabric they're not familiar with, that's not necessarily going to get you branded as a witch. It'll just mean you have some exotic item. People in medieval Europe were aware that faraway cultures had exotic goods that they did not make locally. People were familiar with were, were familiar with the idea of Asia and how exotic things could come from Asia, exotic foods, exotic uh, cloth, exotic textiles. And so if you've got some plastic doodad or whatever, um, they're going to be like, oh, what's that? Um, and you tell them, oh, I, you know, bought this in Aleppo or whatever. They're going to be like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> they're not going to try you as a witch. Um, now, what could you get into trouble? Now, if you go around telling people, oh, I'm a time traveler, um, well, here's what's going to happen realistically. They're going to either think that you're crazy or a liar. And either one of those will mean that they won't want to talk to you. And uh, like, what's the point then? Like, why are you going if you're not going to, if everyone's going to think you're weird and not want to talk to you? So that's the main reason why you shouldn't tell people you're a time traveler. I don't know. It, predicting the future, like if you go around telling everybody 700 years from now, there's going to be a great war and blah, blah, blah. And like, they're going to be like, what the heck, dude? Like, what are you talking about? 700 years doesn't mean anything to them. They're just going to think you're a crackpot. If you tell them, oh, I remember reading in the history books three years from now, the king's going to die of poisoning or whatever. Like, don't say that. Because uh, if it makes it seem like you're in on a plot or you have knowledge about a plot to assassinate the king, then you're going to like come into your, you know, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be interrogated. Like, don't even do that. Don't talk about anything that's going to happen in the Middle Ages. Don't talk about what uh, an outcome of a battle is going to be. Don't don't do that. But I want to address this this witchcraft concern. I think people have this idea that everybody was being hung and burned left and right for being a witch in the Middle Ages. Let's clarify some things here. The witch hunting craze was in the early modern period, not in the medieval period. It began in the late 1400s and continued on through the 15-1600s. The 1500s was really the height of it, early 1600s. That was the height of the witch craze. That's not medieval. Through this whole video, I'm assuming you're visiting 1100s, 1200s, 1300s, you know, kind of time frame. Witch hunting wasn't a big deal then. You know, let's understand witchcraft. What is witchcraft? What's the deal with that? Now, witchcraft was understood to be manipulation of unseen physical forces. People believed that there are all these forces in the world that were there that could be manipulated, analogous to magnetism. Obviously, you know, in, a, in the case of a magnet, you have this object that can act on other objects from a distance. There are obviously some invisible forces radiating out from that magnet. And they thought there were other examples of this sort of thing. And so uh, using some kind of incantation in order to affect some, you know, some outcome somewhere else, to cause harm to someone or to, you know, do whatever, uh, they believed that those, that that was a, they believed that that was what we would phrase as a scientific thing, as acting on physical matter and energy. It was just doing it in a way that the general public didn't know how to do. And so knowledge of how to do that came from ancient books. Now, this is the idea. Like if you, you get some kind of training Actually, it doesn't have to come from books, actually. It can come from oral tradition. So you, you'd get some kind of training in how to manipulate nature, um, you know, and then you could go and do that. Uh, and so the fear of witchcraft is the fear that someone would use that knowledge to harm someone. Now, if you pull out a smartphone and you show them your, you know, uh, Flappy Birds or whatever, C Candy Crush, or, they're going to see this screen with all this stuff moving around. They're going to assume that's magic. They're going to call it magic. Um, but whether they hang you for it, or whether, you know, whether they try you as a witch, I think depends on whether they see that as a threat versus a novelty. I don't recommend showing off a piece of tech like that just because it could draw negative attention. You might have criminals who want to 
like attack you and beat you up and steal from you. You don't want to flash your goods around to have thieves find out that they can take something from you. You know, you, you don't want to do that. Uh, so it's just not a good idea from that point of view. Whether you be tried as a witch would, would you know, it's not for sure, but it is possible. Especially if there's some like coincidence that happens. So if you show up and you're flashing around your fancy tech, makes people think you're a magician, and then the local bishop drops dead from an embolism, they might connect you with that, right? So it's just not worth it. It's not worth trying it. Now, another question, I actually saw this on a Joe Scott video. He did a Q&A video and somebody had asked him, well, what if, um, what if you go into medieval Europe and you try to explain to people germ theory? And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'd be ri- they think I'm a witch. Um, germ theory is not necessarily going to get you in trouble talking about germ theory. Uh, most people would not care, I dare say. Here's the situation. People in medieval Europe had different theories about things. Um, I didn't talk about the healthcare system, system, so to speak, in medieval Europe. But here's an example of it. In medieval Europe, there were different systems of medicine. There was a system of medicine where uh, you would uh, learn Latin in order to read ancient texts, and then you would go to university and study medicine, and you would read all these old texts of ancient medical writers. You know, you read Galen, for example, and you'd read all the commentaries on Galen, and you would learn, essentially, that old, that ancient Greek Hellenistic Greek medical knowledge that had been passed down through the centuries. And and then you would work as a doctor and you would prescribe medicine and you would diagnose people's illnesses, you know, using Galenic style medicine. But not everybody used that. There was also, and there were there were other medical practitioners. There were surgeons and barbers that would do things like extracting a tooth or fixing a, a broken bone or, you know, amputation or things like that. That was more of a trade. They didn't really have a medical theory that they worked with. They just knew about the actual act of amputation, the actual act of setting a bone, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then there was another kind of area of medical practice, so to speak, using that term loosely, which was kind of the um, the folk medicine that would be used in an area, which was typically passed down through women, lines of women from mother to daughter. And they would have ideas with like, okay, you've got a scratch or a boil or whatever. Here's how you treat it. You go get these herbs and you do this sort of thing. And it was a combination of actual practical things like people knew that if you got an injury, if your skin was broken, pour wine over it before you bandage it up. Um, they didn't know why wine helped. They just knew it did. And we know wine helps because the alcohol kills the germs. They didn't know what that mechanism was. They just knew that's what helped. But then that would be com- combined with what we would regard as completely like superstitious things like... Um, Oh, I can't even think of the examples, but the the examples get really ludicrous, actually. Um, And for them, it was all just the same mass of practice and theory. But anyway, let's take that wine example. Let's say you you come across uh, someone who's got a gash in their arm and a local woman or maybe their cousin knows about this stuff. Cousin comes over and she's uh cleansing it with wine or vinegar and you're like oh you know what you're doing you're killing germs here let me tell you about germ theory the reaction is going to be like "Eh, okay whatever you say man like i don't see them i don't see the germs you're talking about but i guess so they don't care they're not going to say oh foreign ideas let's burn you at the stake they're not going to do that they're just going to be like whatever dude you know i guess that's what you think um so I, I think it gets a little bit, my point is, I think it's a little, it gets a little bit overblown when people think, oh, if you're a time traveler in medieval Europe, you're going to be burned at the stake as a witch. Um, no. I mean, there are situations where you could get into that, where that could happen. But if you're prudent and you don't draw attention to yourself, you don't go around blabbing that you 
have all this fancy technology, I don't think you need to worry about it. All right, so that's it. Uh, that'll be it for now. It's kind of a long video. Uh, check out the suggested reading to do further reading about this before you go. Um, I'll have it scrolling on the screen and in the description. And uh, have a good trip. Good luck. Stay safe.